Hello and welcome to the latest panel from Roy Spence Oil and Gas, strengthening your ESG gain and edge with transformative tech in partnership with our sponsors, Engage Mobilize. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jade Waters. I head up the um, Roy Spence Oil and Gas team here. And there are over 500 of you signed up today. So thanks so much for the great response. And thank you in advance to our partners Engage for bringing together such a great session today. Um, today's panel will be looking at the changes within the energy industry accelerated by digitaliz digitalization and in context of the global energy transition. In particular, the panelists will be discussing the long-standing issues surrounding data and how data management can give you the power to accelerate workflow efficiencies and drive collaboration. There will be room for a 10 minute Q&A at the end. So if you wanna gain maximum value from the session uh, and interact with our panelists, do get your questions at the ready. Um, you can send them through throughout the using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Our expertise today is Matthew Denkner, um, Supply Chain Director at Whiting Petroleum Corporation, Rob Ratinsky, CEO of Engage, and Hassam al -Badoui. Managing Director of SCF Partners. Thank you so much for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll hand over to our chair for the day, Farhana Morales, Implementation Specialist and ESG Advisor at Engage. Farhana, over to you. Thank you, Jade. It's my pleasure to moderate this discussion today. My name is Farhana Morales, and I have worked in the oil and gas industry for over 14 years, working in many US basins and overseas in North Africa. I consider myself an anomaly as I'm a woman of color who did not grow up around the oil and gas industry. My parents are from India and I grew up in the United Kingdom. I gained my IT degree from the University of Denver and my master's in finance from CSU. I recently completed an ESG micro-credentialing program at the University of Houston, and I also work for an operator within ESG and sustainability. The insight I bring to my current company, Engage, is very varied in that I am passionate about all things ESG, having experienced a life rich in it before it became popular. I believe strongly that the key to advancing ESG is harnessing the power of technology, which led me to my role at Engage. I am passionate about helping our clients on their ESG journeys by finding them unique solutions technology such as ours can offer. At Engage, our mission is to simplify the B2B pro transaction process by automating financial workflows. Simply digitalizing processes has been commercialized by many solutions. However, Engage is the first to use predictive scheduling and data validation to reduce touch points and eliminate redundant processes, thus changing the way transactions are scheduled, managed, and approved. Additionally, layering on Engage's e-invoicing platform automates your workflows end-to-end -end from scheduling services all the way through payment processing. One automated platform, auditor payment. I personally am a big proponent of automation as that allows our customers to focus on their many other business needs. Now I would like the rest of the panel to introduce themselves. We will start with Rob Ratchitsky. Hi, thank you, Verhana. i um, excited to uh, share with you um, our thoughts here at Engage on where uh, the ESG investment community is pointed. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Engage. Uh, we've been around for uh, five years and uh, service clients um, such as BP and Chevron um, and other uh, nationally based oil and gas clients here in the US. Excellent. Now, Matt Dankner, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Dankner. Uh, I've been in the oil and gas industry. I'm in my sixth year with Whiting Petroleum. I currently lead our, our supply chain and uh, uh, materials management functions. Whiting Petroleum is one of the largest independent ex exploration production companies in the U.S. with a focus on oil, uh, particularly. We operate in the Bakken in North Dakota, and we're one of the largest producers and have been for the past 10 years in that basin. Prior to, prior to my time in oil and gas, uh, I worked for a Fortune 500 uh, global financial services company in a risk management function, and also uh, worked as a, uh, in risk advisory services for uh, a large uh, global um, public accounting firm as well. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And finally, Hassan. 
Um, my name is Hassan Al Badawi. Uh, I manage SCF Venture, which is a venture arm for SCF Partners. Uh, SCF Partners is a private equity investor, been around for 30 years, uh, and we specialize in energy investment across technology, products, and services. Uh, uh, I've been in the industry for 28 years. Uh, first 17 years with uh, Schlumberger in operations and product development roles. And then the last 12 years have been an investment in, in that sector. And we currently have active uh, effort on the ESG side as well as uh, the whole energy value chain. Thank you, Hassam. And thank you, everybody, for introducing yourselves. As you can all hear, we have a great panel today, and I'm really excited for this discussion. I'm going to jump right to the question. So I will start with Matt. Matt, can you speak about how technology, for example, engages application has benefited your company when it comes to ESG? Absolutely. Uh, so with any technology, whether it's Engage or other, other technology platforms, uh, the, the intent is always to leverage those technologies to, to achieve business results, to achieve your organization's goals. And so for, for White in particular and ESG, Engage has been a fantastic tool. It's a tool that we didn't implement specifically for ESG. Uh, we actually implemented before we issued our four, first ES, ESG report. However, uh, we looked at Engage as a huge opportunity. We, we knew that the data, the information that we were going to obtain through uh, Engage Mobilize was going to help us manage our business better. And really, that, that's what ESG is all about. It's about how do you know your business? How do you manage your business? And how do you make incremental improvements that make your business sustainable, uh, perform better, more efficiently? Um, uh, with less resources and ultimately, you know, contribute from that perspective. So when, when we looked at Engage and, and we looked at some of the, uh, some of the information we needed to report on for um, ESG, Engage was an ideal solution for us. It's a solution we already had. It was a solution that was already a high ROI, uh, high return on investment solution that we implemented years ago. And we looked at Engage as a way to, to begin tracking one of the most important pieces for us, which is our waste. And so uh, we, we use Engage to manage the vendors that, that handle huge waste streams for us. Uh, those waste streams represent an enormous cost and, and something that we're very focused on managing. And, and on top of that, it gave us the insight and the ability to help us ensure that our waste is being handled properly. It's being disposed of in accordance with uh, regulations in the various basins and areas we operate. It, it helps us hold our vendors accountable to make sure that they're doing what we expect. Um, between GPS tracking, the, the rich data information that we get from the platform, it, it really was an ideal solution for Whiting to, to begin that journey uh, reporting for ESG. It, you know, it's hard for me though, because I look at Engage Mobilize and, and we started on the journey with Engage uh, just because it was good business and just because it, it helped us manage our costs because it helped us streamline our operations. And, um, and ESG just you know, became a requirement after we implemented Engage, but we, we looked at the platform as, as an ideal uh, solution to, to a problem that we had and, and something that we wanted to do for ESG. Thank you, Matt. I think you hit on some really important factors and points there. Um, me, myself, having worked for an oil and gas operator and, you know, actually helping them report on some of these ESG and sustainability metrics, I saw the big struggle internally within a company to actually do the reporting, gather all these metrics, and especially when some of these metrics are related to third-party information. So, for example, if you have a trucking company, a service contractor, that's not really in your house you know how do you then gather the information from them and I think a lot of technology and especially like our platform can help enable that we we kind of bridge, bridge the gap alleviate the stress and the pressure on operators such as yourself and so I'm that's why I'm hearing from you and again like you said ESG isn't something new it's become popular. A lot of people are discussing it, but you know, you've always uh, had to report on these metrics, always had these challenges and struggles. So it's nice to see that we're able to complement your business model and help you move forward with that. And my next question is to Hassam. In your experience, how do you think technology and ESG can complement one another? 
I, I think technology could offer a lot of uh, uh, a lot of solution for ESG and make things possible that uh, was not possible in the past. You know, I'm an engineer by training and a Lean Six Sigma black belt, and I can done a lot of uh, process improvement. And I can tell you, if you don't measure, you can't improve. So, and you 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 have to measure first to be able to improve and change your process and uh, uh, bring about that efficiency. And ESG is no different than that. Uh, and uh, on, on two angles, one of them is you need to be able to find out where your emission is coming from, where, where's the areas, uh, the 8020 that you need to tackle, yes? And that comes with better recording, better measurement, like uh, Matt mentioned earlier. Uh, on the other side also, you know, to be able to do the reduction, you have to do uh, uh, operational and process improvements. And those comes from the data, the mapping, and, uh, you know, from what I've seen from Engage, that's really the core uh, proposition here is to be able to help you see where the challenges are in your process, how big the problem is, where where is the biggest impact uh, on your process, when it comes to ESG and uh, operational improvement in general. So I think technology has a lot of, to play uh, to uh, help us advance the ESG agenda uh, going forward. Great, thanks Hossam. I really like what you mentioned, especially about the operational efficiency. I think right now there's a lot of pressure on industry, specifically oil and gas. Um, you know, we, we're always kind of held to a higher standard because of our environmental impact, but technology has really helped us over the years to improve efficiencies such as, you know, mitigating certain environmental impacts, um, emissions, uh, reduction, or, you know, if you look year over year, a lot of companies have put that as a big priority to, to use technology in the fields. And also, if you look at some of the technological innovations, it, it's, it's kind of mind blowing to, to know how far we've come um, over the last 20 years. Um, it's one of the passions of mine is, you know, we have technology, we have very smart people in several industries, and we can all work together to get to where we need to get with all of these ESG and sustainability targets. My next question is for Rob. As a CEO of Engage, what excites you about the stride Engage is making in the area of ESG? Thanks, Ron. I think, I think to start off, um, just what we're doing internally as a company, you know, it, it's one thing to help support our clients with their initiatives um, and the business outcomes they're looking to create both uh, on the investment side and with respect to managing their assets from an ESG perspective. But I think internally for us um, as a young growing technology company, uh, really bringing um, those initiatives in house has uh, not only attracted amazing talent like Farhana to our team, um, but really sets us apart and sets the stage for where we're headed. Um, because if we are gonna support our clients with these initiatives, we also have to live and breathe it. And, you know, worldwide, I think, um, you know, whether you're talking Canada, um, the EU, Australia, um, this push has been going on for close to a decade. And, you know, with respect to oil and gas um, in the energy transition, uh, we're just starting to see those pressures applied by the investment communities, um, specifically on um, our clients. And I think it's a chance for the industry um, to step back, rebrand itself. Um, we've always been highly concerned, highly regulated um, on the environmental side, but um, that message isn't that clear um, to the general population. And I just wanted to share a few stats. For those of you um, who are thinking that this might be a flash in the pan, um, according to the Wall Street Journal, 56% of households with income ranges 100 to 250K would rather invest and prefer to invest um, in companies with positive ESG impacts. Um, that's obviously within the US. Last year, 51 billion in new capital flowed into US sustainable funds uh, for the whole fiscal year of 2020. Um, just starting off Q1 of 2021, 
21 billion in new capital flowed into US sustainable funds. And at the same time, over in Europe, 27 billion in new capital flowed into European ESG ETFs. Overall, you guys, ESG assets are tracking to exceed 53 trillion, um, more than a third of projected AUM by 2025. And so to ignore this would be a mistake, um, not only by the oil and gas industry, um, but just holistically, I think as an economy. And so uh, we're really excited to kind of live and breathe it and engage. Um, but some of the impacts that we have right now for our clients are really, really just come down to creating audit trails for self-reporting. Um, I think uh, with the new pressures coming down from the LPs and the investment community, there's a little bit of a scramble going on to try to standardize these data sets and really get a handle on well, if we are going to report, what are we going to report? And if we do that, how do we standardize that across our business ad assets and our portfolio? And so they're looking for tools uh, like Engage to help really self-report um, to the agencies that are out there. I'm really excited um, as a CEO to be part of that transition. Um, and like Matt mentioned earlier, I mean, it's good business practice, but you can't actually um, support your initiatives unless you tie this to the financial backbone of your company. And what I mean by that is you have to create an audit trail that points back to the dollar spent on these initiatives and on the activity uh, with respect to compliance um, for the environment. And so Engage is out there tracking a lot of the, like Matt, Matt mentioned, um, the waste um, and the air compliance uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for these companies. Um, we're creating that look back um, that's happening in real time um, so that companies like Whiting can report on this um, up to their executive team on a daily basis and out to the shareholders um, at quarter and fiscal year close. And so uh, we are also in the, you know, the third or fourth inning of this um, as a company, but I think, uh, if you're not on board with this transition, um, you're gonna be you're gonna fall by the wayside. And so um, this has been a pivot that's been very exciting for our technology and our company, and uh, we're excited to grow with our clients um, and help support them in their initiatives going forward. Thank you, Rob. What I'd like to also point out is, you know, sometimes ESG and sustainability can be a struggle depending on the company size. So some companies, you know, their resources are so much bigger and larger and expensive. They have the ability to, you know, become gold standard members of the ESG and sustainability community. Some others just see this as a struggle. And what I absolutely love about Engage is we don't see a difference in our clients and customers. We want to help everyone. You could be a small service contractor. You could be a smaller operator. You could be a large operator. We want to apply the same passion and energy towards helping our clients with data capture and, and some of these ESG metrics that we're investigating on how can we help our clients with. So I see ESG and sustainability as a marathon, not as a sprint. Um, we're all in it together. And the best thing we can do as a company is really hold everybody's hand and, and kind of give it a team effort. My next question is to Matt. What has been your biggest ESG data capture challenge and how has Engage helped you overcome that? So uh, as I mentioned in my intro, I'm, I'm responsible for supply chain and materials management at Whiting. So I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, I, I'm not responsible for all ESG initiatives at Whiting, but uh, certainly if, if you look at our ESG report from last year, supply chain is interwoven in, in, in many of the areas we're reporting in. I think one of the biggest challenges we've had is, is simply uh, with, uh, looking at certain types of reporting that we need. So specifically in my area, I'm responsible for supply chain. So uh, waste tracking really falls under my area because it's our vendors, it, it's our service providers that are really handling all of that waste for us. And, and so trying to tackle that alone, just one waste stream, right? it is incredibly difficult and, and really impossible if it's not approached in a systematic uh, process-based technology supported way. And, and so for us, and, and just for the folks on the phone, just to, to, to talk through one way stream and, and how challenging this could be, um, you know, when, when we look at, for example, produced water, which is 
uh, the water that comes up with oil and, and gas from the ground. Uh, we have to handle that water responsibly. It has to be you know, disposed of or recycled responsibly. It's regulated. In other words, you know, the basins we operate, we can't just you know, dump it in a lake or, or go do something with that water. We have to go to licensed, uh, you know, licensed uh, organizations that are licensed to handle that waste and, and that will dispose of it properly or, or recycle it or um, you know, purify it properly. And so for us, we have an obligation as an operator. So forget about ESG, forget about, you know, all, all the stuff that's going on. And, and, you know, as an operator, we, we actually spent resources. We went out and audited these facilities to verify that their licensing was there, to verify that they had the proper processes in place to handle our, our wastewater, you know, to, to ensure that they, they, you know, that there are organizations that we could trust with our waste so that we knew that that waste would be handled appropriately. And, and so we spent all these resources for years. We did it for 10 years and we had no way of ensuring that that, that truck driver or that, that person transporting the waste was actually taking it to the facility that we wanted them to take it to. So if you look at the billing, they could say, hey, I, I took it to you know, facility A, but did, did we know that that water actually got there? <laughs> yes. Or did they dump it in a field somewhere? Right. You know, so for us, you know, we we wanted to do more. We, we did all the audit work. We did all the prep. We, we ensured that every partner that we had relative to that waste stream was licensed, had the proper procedures. In fact, in, 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 in several respects, we were looking at those folks and, and had a higher standard than just meeting compliance requirements. And, and we wanted to make sure our water was being handled appropriately. And so for us, we didn't have the technology, we didn't have a way to do it. And, and to put it into perspective, we're producing you know, millions and millions and millions of barrels of water that's being moved you know, 100 to 200 barrels at a time, right? So to put that into perspective, that, that volume moving across our fields to, to these partners that are disposing of the water is just incredible. And without technology process in place, you just you can't possibly manage it. And so for, when we implemented Engage, one of the biggest features that we looked at was really that GPS tracking, GPS fencing. So I can literally go on a computer screen, pull up and say, I know everybody that's hauling this water to, to our you know, approved vendors. And I can say, I, I know what routes they're taking. I know that they actually took the water to where it was supposed to go because we have geofencing on all the approved disposals, all the approved you know, purification plants that were, you know, that we've audited, that we've vetted, that we know is going to handle this waste appropriately. And, and I can actually verify that real time. I can, I can log in, look at a computer screen, see where all the trucks that are working for Whiting are, see where they're going and, and, and know that they're actually taking that waste to where, where it's supposed to go. And, and so for us, you know, that's just, it, it's, we felt like it was what we had to do regardless. We started on that journey really before ESG. And, and, and as we've implemented ESG, you know, again, it's just good business. It, it's just the right thing to do. Um, it helps us control and manage our costs. We're not getting bills for waste that we didn't produce, for example. So it, it just ties into everything. And, and so without a system like Engage, uh, you know, these, these efforts are really almost impossible. Great, Matt. So what you're speaking to is that transparency that you have as an operator between yourself and, for example, a service contractor. And I think this is key today. I, I get asked a lot of times, when you're opening up a sustainability report for a company, then you go towards the end, you'll see an appendix section, you'll see a metric section, and there'll be lots of metrics in there, for example, waste water metrics how the question i always get asked how do you know that those are valid metrics well unless you get all of your metrics audited which is a very expensive process and most companies don't do that currently i mean they may get one audited one metric audited or another you don't really know you it's kind of like a best guess but when you're able to use technology such as engage you can actually physically see that somebody actually did that. They actually hauled water from one location to another. And when I came on board 
to engage. And I actually physically saw the application on the web and on my phone. So it's an application that actually sits on the phone of the person that's tr transporting this waste or water you can physically see where they start and where they end and it was a, it was very enlightening to me the fact that that transparency is there for the operator now they can now hold their service contractors accountable for that but then also that esg impact we know that that waste or water ended up where it needed to go and so there's going to be no negative repercussions as to it went somewhere where it wasn't supposed to go so thank you for highlighting that matt Hossam, next to you, why are your thoughts on following a holistic approach to ESG? ESG can no longer live in a silo, and I wonder what you thought about that. Absolutely, I think, uh, I think the recent effort, and, and Rob mentioned some statistics on you know, the pressure the industry is getting on ESG, and obviously ESG as a, as a name, uh, different people define it differently. So for me, I define it as you know, reducing emission, uh, you know, uh, lowering the impact on the environment. Uh, others might think of it ESG as the, uh, you know, alternative uh, sources of energy and, and so on, but I'm focused on it as a reducing emission and impact on the environment. And certainly the examples Rob and Matt gave about how the, you know, technology and the platform shows transparency. And once you have that transparency, you can improve and, and reduce the impact on the environment, reduce the energy on energy conversion ratio. So you're spending less energy and less uh, emissions to produce certain uh, amount of energy is all going in the right direction and feeds into the ESG. And to answer specifically your uh, question about ESG holistic view, we've seen uh, uh, a similar trend in HSNE. You know, some of us who joined the industry quite some time ago uh, you know, it used to be a different standard on EH, HSNE, and uh, the leadership of the industry uh, took that seriously. And and uh, I remember that uh, uh, you know it started by people uh, every meeting talking about uh, safety at the beginning of the meeting and reporting on on safety. And the leadership of the organization personally taking responsibility of safety metrics and incidents, and also operators dictating. Uh, you know, certain metrics, otherwise you don't work with us as a, as a service provider. I think we need to see that in, in ESG too. Uh, we need to see that leadership from the industry uh, of people, uh, you know, uh, implementing, uh, you know, technology like Matt has done, yes, uh, and, and bring it in the forefront and talking about it more uh, in their, uh, uh, you know, leadership meetings and, and taking position on the issue versus just building it in a, in a report, consolidating it and, you know, issuing once a quarter. Those are two different things in my view. We still need to do that. But if we don't take a leadership and put it in the center of what we do and be environmentally responsible while producing that energy, I think we're leaving a very big opportunity. Great points, Hossam. And I'm a big proponent of holistic approaches just in general in companies. I feel if we're all in this together, whether you're an operator, whether you're a company like us, engage, whether you're on a board of directors, um, I think if we all work together holistically on the ESG and sustainability challenges, it's going to make us stronger and we can help one another. The one aspect of ESG and sustainability that I really enjoy is it's not a competition and, and I've never seen it like that. Um, you know, I've worked with many people from other companies and we all band together really to help one another, educate one another, to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to these efforts and challenges. And I, I'm glad we're moving away from this silo where it used to all be in health and safety. You know, you'd have a health and safety team in an organization and then, you know, maybe some people in the company would be, you know, impacted by that. But now it, it's not a choice. And I, I really like that because that's how we're going to grow, evolve and really change and make positive strides in ESG and sustainability. And, and Farhana, if I just add one, one comment, Pe people yes. normally in technology, and I've been around technology all my career and, and you know, from implementation to development, to investment, uh, people look for a silver bullet. Uh, technology that is going to completely change the game. And in reality, we have very, very few silver bullet technologies. And when we do, they take very long time to implement. But actually, 80, 70, 80% 80 to 70% of the improvement 
normally comes from incremental improvements. So measuring, uh, you know, bringing up the, uh, highlighting where the problem is, attacking the problem, doing process change. And to do that, you need tools uh, to be able to do that. And if we do that, I think we, we, we advance the ESG agenda very far uh, versus waiting for a silver bullet that's going to come change everything overnight, which tend not to happen that, that frequently. Yes, I completely agree, Hossam. And I would say this is very strategy-based and trending-based. Well, an another thing I've seen is it's all good and well to report metrics year after year, 2018, 2019, 2020. But what's actually what's the strategy behind those metrics? Um, you know, are your emissions going up? Are they going down? If they're going down, what, what did you actually do? And can you explain what you did in order to achieve that lowering of emissions? If they went up, are you providing transparency as to, you know what, this is what happened during this last year, and, and this is a technology, or these are the steps we're taking to mitigate those risks because they do end up becoming financial risks so Arhana, if, if you don't mind I, I i just like to piggyback on Hassan's comment yes uh, so so for us and, and i really appreciate what you said about it's a journey it's incremental improvements it's it's definitely not tools and technology there's no silver bullets um you know for us in, in the way we look at these initiatives and, and certainly the way we approach engage was uh, you know, this is people, process, and a tool or technology. And, and if you don't look at it holistically, if you don't ingrain it into your organization, if it's not fitting into your culture and your operational structures, um, and it, if that continuous improvement mentality that Hassan mentioned, that incremental measure, incrementally improve, make a change, incrementally improve, isn't built into what you're doing, it, it's going to be a, a big challenge for you. And for us, you know, I, I, I've I've seen organizations, I've heard of, uh, you know, colleagues approaching ESG from a not at Whiting, but but certainly at, at other operators approaching ESG as a check the box exercise and something we need to do on top of what we're currently doing. And for us, and, and all the benefits we've gotten and continue to get from software like softwares like Engage and, and taking a data driven, measured technology approach, have all come over time. So we didn't get all the benefits from Engage, you know, the, the first three months we implemented. All the benefits have come because we've looked at it, we've, we've done things like turned on geofencing at, at, our, at our saltwater disposals and at our, our processing plants to make sure that the waste that we're bringing there is actually getting there. Um, you know, all the, you know, leveraging auto dispatch to make sure that we're never, uh, you know, taking an extra trip with a truck to move waste. Right, so again, we're measuring the number of trips we take, we, we're measuring the miles driven, and we're beginning to say, okay, how can we reduce that? And Hassam, to your point, it, it's a journey, right? It's, you, you have to measure, you have to identify opportunities to, to continue to improve um, and, and then take those incremental steps to get those gains over time. And you cannot do that without people in process. It, it, it just is impossible. And so, for us, we again engage was engage, you know, engage was ingrained in what we were doing. It existed before ESG. We're just leveraging the engage platform again to collect data that, that was ESG related. We're already tracking a lot of it anyway, because it's just good business. And, and so from that perspective, I think if, if you're taking an approach outside of that, if you're looking for kind of the magic pill that's going to fix everything and, and take care of everything overnight, you're Hopefully investors are smart, Rob, to your point. Hopefully investors see that. Hopefully investors are going to be able to read through that. And I, I look forward to the, to the point where, you know, data is transparent. You can look at an operator, look at a company and say, these folks actually know what they're doing. They're, they are a well-run company. They track, measure, improve. They're efficient. And, and that's where I think the opportunities are moving forward. Thank you, Matt. So the one key word I keep hearing in my head is patience too. ESG and sustainability, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, you're not going to go from, you know, reporting very little to reporting 100% because again, I mean, all of these businesses and companies that have, have, you know, committed to reporting ESG and sustainability metrics, 
they also have other tasks and, and business uh, problems to attend to. So I think that if people can understand if they do harness technology, uh, such as engages or even any kind of other method, patience is key because those results will come over time. And again, as long as you know people are passionate and, and everybody is engaged and in it together, I think that that will complement these uh, challenge, you know, beating these challenges. So Rob, uh, can you discuss some tangible benefits and results that your clients have experienced from using our software? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, some of the commentary has, has kind of done a good job of teeing me up there. Um, also, there are some questions coming through the chat that are kind of addressing um, what I'll call the social component of this, which is where H and, you know, where the health and safety part are inherently rooted um, into our day-to-day -day operations. Um, oil and gas operators um, really, uh, th their risk goes up um, with more activity on their locations and their leases. Um, and what uh, Engage can do um, or technology that drives efficiency into these disparate supply chains is re really reduce the amount of traffic. Um, the number one cause of incidents that are reported through OSHA or um, for an operator, um, you know, on their 10K all come from driving, really. I mean, it's, it's all trying to keep people off the road. Um, last year, um, we looked at Chevron Colorado's data with respect to what Matt is talking about. Um, and by using um, our predictive scheduling tool um, and machine learning, we're actually able to take tens of thousands of heavy truckloads off the road in Colorado on a yearly basis um, for that one operator. If you look at scaling that up um, in some of the larger basins, um, not only are the emissions uh, coming out of the tailpipes of those heavy hauls um, significant uh, to those individual operators and can help, help offset their carbon footprints, um, but from that sort of social part of the, what we're talking about here, um, just keeping people safe um, and keeping some of that traffic off the road. And that's uh, fundamentally what HSC departments are trying to do on a continuous basis um, is get people home at night to their families. And so we're really excited about the data that we're seeing because the technology is designed um, to really schedule things down to the minute based on production and um, what is coming out of the wells and the lacks themselves. So that's one example. Um, another example, you guys, because, you know, ESG is rooted in driving efficiencies into these global disparate supply chains. And the less energy that you can expound getting either, um, you know, materials needed for extraction of energy to your facilities and your well sites, coupled with getting your product to market um, are, are just massive impacts, right? As you drive efficiencies into those, uh, you're, you're gonna see um, reduction in your own carbon footprint. Um, but I think what's important, and when we are talking to the executives and the C-suites within these companies is you're going to have to look at changing some of the financial governance that surrounds um, this transaction process. And that's really where we come in because we're driving transparency real time into those day-to-day -day transactions um, and allowing the CFO and the executive suite to actually report on them in a much quicker fashion. The industry today runs in arrears. Everything you pay for happened 30, 60, 90 days ago. Um, and so if we can give the executive team a clearer picture of what's happening in real time and the dollars they're spending, that gives them an opportunity to change their governance, change their contract structures on the supply chain side, change the way that they interact with their service providers, um, which I think lessen the burden um, and for sure um, mitigate the amount of energy needed to both bring inventory to site and product to market. And that um, is going to be huge as these companies battle um, the carbon credit war that is going to be taking place globally here. Um, it's easy for some of the larger international companies to take advantage of things that they can do to offset some of that. You know, if they, you know, 
internationally, but um, for some of the nationally based oil companies, it's, it's a tough journey and it's going to be coming right out of the bottom line if they can't find ways to lower their impact. Um, we've been able to help with that uh, with some of the largest operators here in the US. And I think um, it really is just a starting point um, as you look at the supply chain holistically. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, I like that you, you know, you tied into that transparency between, you know, the financial risk and being able to see that whole trail. You know, our platform can expedite the whole payment process. Um, in the past, I know I worked at oil and gas operators where, you know, payment used to be 90 plus days and, you know, things would fall through the cracks. You know, some people were using really um, old school methods of tracking financial transactions through an operator and service contractor. And what I really like about our platform is everything's very transparent. Everything flows very efficiently, you know, paperless system. I mean, back in the day when I actually went out into the oil fields and I would see tickets floating around on the ground, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to reduce that type of impact also by using technology. Um, and that financial transparency is going to be key for that. So thank you. Uh, Matt, um, another question for you. Why are scope three emissions so difficult to capture and report? I know many companies are struggling with ESG metrics in general. Um, I myself work for an oil and gas operator in the past and experienced the internal frustration surrounding this. Yeah, you know, scope through emissions is incredibly challenging. And if you think about it, right, I, I'm I'm going to a vendor and I'm asking them to either provide, you know, a manufactured uh, piece of equipment or um, perform a service for me. And it, it's to your point, Farhana, it, it's hard enough in, in the traditional oil and gas environment with invoicing and kind of delays and tracking all this information it's hard enough just to understand your costs and get that real time and look at that and be able to, to drive change, right? When you think about scope three emissions, you not only need to do all of that stuff well, you need to get this additional layer of information from your vendor, right? And, and then on top of that, you need to then help try and drive scope three emissions. So the challenges in terms of just tracking scope three emissions are immense, right? And just getting to a number for scope three emissions are immense. Then, then you've got to ask yourself, how, how the heck as an operator do I start to drive improvement? You know, once, once you collect all that information. So I, you know, this is an interesting one for me. I, I'm, I'm not responsible for emissions reporting overall at Whiting. Uh, it, it just isn't really related to supply chain directly in that way. However, when it comes to scope three emissions and you're looking at your supply chain, that, that will eventually probably fall under me. And, and I think the, the first piece is you have to look at this. And again, this is just looking at it, trying to dissect the problem. But if you look at it, you have to really turn that on its head. You have to say, you have to look at your supply chain and say, I cannot operate the way that I have. I have to take a different approach to operating. I have to have stronger relationships with my vendors. I have to understand more about their business than I ever have. I have to partner with them. I have to use dedicated vendors because trying to collect all of this information is incredibly challenging if, if you if you just have that traditional invoice we pay you relationship, right? And and so that's the starting point is it's incredibly difficult and and um, trying to look at that and understand all of your vendor your vendor base. If you uh, I look at operators that are out there and, and if you still have the traditional supply chain model, I I don't see a path to getting there, and and so. For me, you know, specifically at Whiting, we've been on a journey within supply chain. We do not look like other operators at this point from a supply chain perspective. Uh, the, the consolidation we've done with our vendors, the transparency we have, the understanding of our vendors, um, the relation, the dedicated relationships we have really turn that old model on its head where, hey, I've got 10 companies, I just call out whoever is available. We, we don't really as an organization operate that way anymore. And to me, that was the first step that that maybe opened up some doors and opened up some paths to being able to report scope three uh, emissions. However, we didn't do it because of scope three emissions. We, we did it because it's better business. We're, we're looking at thinner margin businesses. You know, we're in a new, you know, really a new economy for oil and gas companies. And we looked at companies like uh, manufacturers who operate on much thinner margin and tried to steal and take ideas from them. If, if you're running a manufacturing plant, 
you don't pick up the phone each morning and, and call one of 10 vendors to get, you know, item A that is going into your manufacturing line and is going to be part of your output. You really have a dedicated supply chain with organization, with dedicated suppliers that you trust. You know the quality of the, the you know, parts and materials you're getting from those suppliers. There's, there's planning around that that historically hasn't really been a focus of oil and gas in the same way it has been in other industries. And, and we're, we're really on that journey trying to take that approach. Great. And you mentioned inventory and, and supply chain. I just wanted to let everybody know we do have inventory management as part of our Engage platform. And I do remember working at an operator and having to track everything in an Excel spreadsheet, which was very painful. It wasn't on the cloud. And then my field locations in Montana and North Dakota, then we had to share the spreadsheet. Who knew if you know those actual the actual pipe or the actual equipment was still where we thought it was. And so I really like this whole technological approach to even inventory management and supply chain. I think it's going to be a way to reduce cost. It's going to be a, another way to be transparent about what you have and you can reduce wastage. I mean, you don't want to order pipe and equipment if it's already sitting there in the field somewhere, but you just don't know about it. So I like that aspect of that transparency and supply chain also. Um, and then to go back to scope three, scope three is so broad. When I looked at scope three initially um, a year ago, um, I just looked at that and thought, how are companies even going to attempt to report any of these subcategories in scope three? Some of them are internal. Some of them are very third party based. For example, transportation upstream and downstream. Another one is emissions, scope three emissions tied to waste. How are you going to track that? And so that is one of the challenges that I and my team have personally taken on at Engage. We're investigating and coming up with possible solutions where we can help operators such as Matt's, uh, like Whiting, where here we have a solution for you now that you don't have to do any additional work, just use the application and then we've built in some additional technology that we're currently working on and hopefully we'll be able to push that out and, and just really complement what, you know, what everybody's using Engage currently already to do. So yeah, we, hopefully that's something that will come down the line. Hussam, uh, what has changed about the investment community and its desire surrounding ESG reporting? I, I would say there's a there's a lot of change. I think uh, uh, investors have, I mean, certainly the public has uh, put a lot of pressure, and investors have uh, reacted and uh, you know started to demand companies to take seriously the the ESG. And I would say reporting is, is, a, is a big piece of it, but the leadership on ESG, and uh, it starts by reporting, measuring and reporting, uh, so you could do something about it. Uh, but I think this ESG is here to stay. And uh, I think companies already, we're seeing the difference in valuation, uh, both uh, in capital availability and exits, and companies who take ESG seriously and take leadership on it. And, starts uh, reporting, but also doing something about the reports that they're put out and their operations. Uh, obviously, we can't fix everything overnight. And, uh, you know, end of the day, uh, when you're consuming energy, there will be some emission, but there's mitigations for that. And there's a lot of things we could do. I mean, today, uh, you know, we're switching in, in the US uh, and we've been uh, from uh, coal to natural gas and that alone has cut emission dramatically uh, for the US. But at the same time, if you allow your gas to escape along the value chain, uh, you know, today I think by volume is like 1.75, uh, the, the reports out there. If you get it to three and a half to four, then you're polluting as much as uh, coal, yes? So we shouldn't allow this to happen. And how, how, how do we do that is we show leadership on measuring, uh, putting the right sensors, putting the right processes along the value chain, reporting on it, and show transparency. And I think people, the investors, will, will react and say, okay, the industry now is taking the more moral high ground on this topic and taking the leadership on it. And now we could trust them that they will reduce emission and have less impact on the environment. While today, you know, many take this as pushback when we're saying, no, we're not, you know, it's not a problem or it's not as much as you think it's a problem. But what we need is we need to have accurate measurement reporting 
and continuous improvement on it, and we show, show progress. And as investors, we're following the companies who do that, I think would uh, get a lot more capital uh, uh, availability and higher valuation. Great. And I think the, the pressure from the investment community has really spurred on pushing companies to take on this challenge and take it seriously. So I, I don't ever see it as a negative thing. I just think, see it as positive and just it's almost like a support system, like the investment community is asking for this. Let's let's, you know, address these challenges and, and do the best we can with technology, with all these different types of methods of, of eliminating emissions, for example. So thank and you. For Hannah, and for Hannah, there's another point that I think we uh, need to talk about it, uh, which is, you know, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, when people were saying oil consumption has dropped 20 million barrels. I mean, people say it's 15, 20. And, and all of that. But, but what people don't realize that actually there was 80 million barrels being consumed when everything has been shut down. Yeah. So energy is very sticky for our lifestyle as a, as a, as a human, yes? And, yes? and we need to figure out a way to reduce emission and reduce the impact. You know, saying, you know, we can do without it is not a good solution. Actually, the, the continuous improvements that Matt and Rob have been talking about every day is the way to get, get this the right balance uh, so we can continue to uh, enjoy the lifestyles that we do as humans and you know, society at, at large, but at the same time, lower the impact on the environment. Yes. Exactly. So energy is here to stay. I'm a, I've been a proud oil and gas industry uh, member. Uh, I really just think that we can do things better. We can improve. We can take on these technology challenges. And, and let's show you what we can do by harnessing technology and, improve, and making these improvements. So I definitely agree, Hassan. Uh, Rob, last question, and, and we're going to wrap it up with this one because we have to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, can you provide some insight into the direction you see technology and ESG taking? Uh, really simple answer. Um, giving um, our clients the ability to self-report, um, start setting baselines um, that are trackable, um, and, and really partner from an innovation standpoint with them as we figure this out together. Um, I think it's it's important for us to all sort of internalize the fact that we're, we don't have all the answers right now. Um, we're going to have to use technology to reduce our impact on the environment, regardless of if you're talking, you know, emissions, water usage, um, you know, all of the above. But um, I think it's, it's really exciting for us because we were all kind of handed this, you know, like to Matt's point, we were already um, collecting this data and already looking at driving efficiencies into the supply chain. Um, and now uh, we can work with our partners to um, get that information to the investment community, get that information to the market and uh, really start to make strides um, when you start comparing um, like Sam was talking about when you start comparing one operator to another um, and who actually is taking um, the steps to invest um, time and resources into reducing their impact. Uh, I'm just really excited about uh, the opportunity. Um, I'm really excited to work with our client base on it. Um, and I think uh, the horsepower and the knowledge base and the brain power um, on the engineering side that um, exists in our industry um, it's not going to be as challenging as we think. Um, I'm proud to be part of the energy industry um, because we are surrounded by some of the most talented individuals on the planet and uh, working with them to build our technology out is going to be nothing short of fun. So um, yeah, let's jump into the questions. Thanks, Verona. Yep. So just to finish, um, the Engage solution can be implemented quickly and efficiently, providing tangible results and data insights to improve your business operations. For those that are interested in learning and seeking to see how Engage can directly impact your company, I'm going to list the website in our chat where you can connect with us. So if you want to connect with us, please click on that hyperlink and then we will follow up with you. Jump. 
So the first question, will ESG be part of audits in the future? And that's from David Brett. Does anybody have a crystal ball on that one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it, I, I'm not a gambler, but I, I think there's a good chance it's publicly released information, particularly for publicly traded companies. And, you know, as more and more of the, the investment community begins to rely on that information as part of investment decisions, uh, I, I certainly think there's a chance, but, you know, it's one of those things. I, I think the yeah. Farhan, Hassan, you do you have comment. more insight into that? I, I, I agree with you, Matt, but I, I think, I think talking to the big audit firms, all of them have active, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, active efforts internally on how to audit that in the future. But like uh, there was an, uh, another question about standards on this. To audit, you have to have standards. And to have standards, you have to have history and measurement long enough to be able to establish the standards and find the right metrics for every operation, every, you know, every type of business is different, yes? So I, I would say they will come, but I don't think they come fast enough uh, because we don't have enough data. We need to measure more. We need to establish standards and then audit against them. Yes. Yeah, I, I personally think ESG will be part of audits in the future. Right now, it's a struggle. I know I heard once in a forum, one metric uh, that was audited by a financial firm cost $50,000, just one metric. So that's one emission metric. I mean, if you look in the back of a sustainability report, there's hundreds of metrics. And so for me, if it's going to be part of the future, um, there has to be standardized, standardization in data, like Hossam said, like everybody has to be apples to apples. And then the auditing has to become more affordable and to everybody. I mean, you can't expect a big company to take on auditing and then leave, leaving a small company behind because they don't have the resources or the capital to push towards auditing. So I think it, it's it will come down the line. Uh, and then if people can prepare right now with just measuring, like Hossam said, they can get to a good place. I think too, uh, you guys, Engage recently has been working with the DOD. Um, and it is quite clear at the federal level um, that they uh, are working on these initiatives as well. And if the feds are looking for the DOD to report on their ESG initiatives, I think that we're gonna be looking at audit trails in the future coming down from the SEC and other departments because um, it just makes good sense for the economy, period. Um, and, and it ends there. And so if the feds are getting involved and you look at the sort of um, political landscape today, um, it's, it's coming and it's coming quickly from my point of view. Great. So and Rob, just to piggyback on what you said and Assam said, I. I, I, one thing I, I could see happening uh, is because of the focus on the ESG reporting, uh, before there's external audits, I, I'd envision even at a board level, the board asking, for example, an internal audit function or, or kind of independent verification and validation, not a full-blown audit. I, I think there'll be some progress there just, just because of what's at stake and how important these initiatives are. Yeah, and for those of you on the call who are not within our industry, you guys, the remuneration structures for our executives have changed considerably over the past 18 months um, to follow and shadow exactly what Matt's talking about. It's no longer an option. Um, the executives are going to be bonused on their initiatives and they're pushing that down throughout the management layers in our organizations. Um, and I think it's having amazing impacts on the, the way like Matt's talking about that Whiting operates on their supply chain department today. And um, so audit, yes. Um, and I think if we embrace it um, as a community and as an industry, um, we can drive the talk track and we can drive what we want um, to report and audit um, for the investment community. Um, but we have to be proactive in that. And we have to look at technologies to be proactive um, to collect that data. Right. There's a specific question to Matt. Um, from the operator point of view, apart from data gathering, what other challenges do you see in reporting emissions? What tools are operators using to support the ESG plans? And do they have an actual relationship with future production plans? So 
I'm not responsible for emissions at, at reporting at Whiting. And, and so I can, I can talk tangentially to this a little bit and just some of the challenges I know exist out there. So as, as a large independent operator, we have we have facilities and and uh, you know oil and gas locations that we developed in an intentional way, and then we've got facilities that we acquired assets that we acquired over time, that were developed in a completely different way, right? Uh, from a surface facility perspective and all those things. So I know that that poses significant challenges for us uh, when we look at kind of macro level reporting across our all of our assets. Um, in addition to that, I, I think when, when you go down this road of, of reporting, really the, the biggest piece is flaring. And so, and, and I know that's, a, you know, it's something we don't want to do. We don't want to sit there and, and burn our gas and not get any return for it. Okay, that's, that's, that's a, not a, a waste stream. You know, uh, gas is, is energy that can be used. It's used to produce electricity. It's used in a million different ways. It, and, and we want to get that to market. And, and so I think if, if you think that you're not, that, that uh, emissions reporting is not going to impact your future plans, and, and a key part of future planning is, is how you get uh, your, your product to market, specifically gas. I mean, I, I just don't know how, you, how you, emissions isn't going to be impacted when you think about it from that perspective. And, and again, I, I'm not responsible for it. I'm just you know, trying to respond as best I can. Well, thanks so much to our panelists. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Uh, there are a lot of questions and uh, people requesting information about the topics discussed. Um, I'm sure Engage will be happy to follow up with individuals after the webinar. So just let me know if you'd like me to put you in touch with them and I can coordinate that. And um, if you want to hear more on the topics mentioned today, Please join us um, in October for our Future Oil and Gas 2021 event, which will be addressing all of these issues and more across a full two-day programme. You can learn more about the speaking lineup, agenda, and how to register at our website, www.royceevents.com forward slash events forward slash future oil and gas. Many thanks again to all our panellists for participating today. I'm sure you've all found that insight valuable. And Fahana, thank you so much for moderating the session. Um, really, really interesting stuff there. Um, you will have access to the full recording after the webinar. So please do share with your colleagues, clients, the whole community. We want to spread the knowledge as much as possible. And thank you so much for tuning in. Goodbye. Thanks, thank Jade.